So Peter, um, uh, you know, we're in, we wanted you on the show. Thanks for coming on, by the way. But we wanted you on the show because these are a bit uh, unprecedented times, and I've heard, I've heard people say things. You know, people who uh, you know are, are are kind of on your side say things like the medicine may be worse than the disease, and, and what they're referring to is the the reaction from government, um, the the trillions of dollars that they're trying to pump into what they'll say the economy, the the, the stimulus checks, the you know all this money that that may actually cause uh, things to be much much worse than they are now. What's your stance on on what's going on now with how the government is reacting to um, in terms you know in terms of economics, uh, you know the money that they're pumping in. Well, there's no doubt that the cure is worse than the disease, but you have to understand exactly what I'm referring to because you have to separate uh, the two things that we're doing. So first you have <clears throat> the efforts to contain the spread of the virus, right? Where everybody is encouraged to stay at home and not to interact and not to go to work, right? So that's part of it. And you can argue <clears throat> whether or not uh, this is actually the, the appropriate policy. I mean, clearly there's a big cost. If that's the policy, if that's what we're going to do, then we've got to be willing to accept the economic consequences of that, right? If we're all going to stop working, uh, then it's going to cost something. And it, it, there's no way the government can magically eliminate those costs. It's just a sacrifice that we're all going to have to make in that we're going to have less money. Uh, you know, we're going to have less stuff to buy. You know, economic activity is going to slow down people are going to lose jobs. We have to decide whether or not that is worth it to avoid uh, this contagion, right? Or, you know, is 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 it not worth it? I mean, obviously, like, one of the things that's happened because so few people are now driving to work is the number of uh, accidents, fatal accidents has gone down. So by everybody staying home, fewer people are dying in automobile accidents. Now, Okay, so should we stay home indefinitely so people don't die in automobile accidents? Or, you know, is our automobile accidents an accepted uh, consequence of, of our lives? I mean, every time we get into a car, we know there's a small chance that we could die in an accident. But we go in a car anyway uh, because we want to enjoy life and we're willing to take that small risk. Uh, you know, so the question is, you know, what are what are we giving up? Is it actually worth the small risk that we end up, uh, you know, getting the coronavirus and then we end up dying from it, which is very, very rare. In fact, the only people that really die from it are people who are old and have a lot of other health problems. And maybe they should be the ones that are staying home and everybody else should just be going about their lives, maybe a little bit more cautious about washing their hands and about not, you know, getting too close to people. Uh, but there's a big, there's a lot of gaps, you know, big, a lot of daylight between what we're doing now and that. So that's one thing. And, you know, I'm not an expert on medicine or science. And so I'm not even going to really um, opine on whether or not this is the correct response. What I am talking about is what the government is doing. In addition to that, because we're all staying at home, the government feels that they have to give everybody a bunch of money. Right. So the government has to bail out all the businesses, bail out all the workers, bail out everybody who's supposedly sacrificing, you know, to fight this war on the coronavirus. And the Fed is just creating trillions and trillions of dollars magically out of thin air. And we're handing it to companies. We're handing it to individuals. We're handing it out to states. That is what I think is going to do all the economic damage, because that money is not free. See, nobody is asking, how are we going to pay for all this money? I mean, if all of us are sitting at home and not working, yet we're getting all these checks in the mail, and a lot of people are going to be getting more money not working than they were paid when they actually had work, when they were doing, doing stuff. But they're not producing anything. They're just sitting at home watching Netflix, and the money is just arriving. And so if we're just going to just shower the country with money that didn't exist until the Fed just magically conjured it into existence, what are the consequences of that? We're going to destroy the value of, of our money. And, it, and so people are going to suffer. And all of the things the government is doing 
to bail out businesses that probably should fail uh, because they're not viable. And everything that we're doing to encourage people not to work is simply going to exacerbate the economic pain that is being created. It's going to delay any kind of recovery. And the other factor that people have to consider is why is the U.S. economy in such a vulnerable position so that this coronavirus is so harmful? And that's because of the debt. That's because of everybody in the economy was you know, maxed out with debt. Companies were levered up. Uh, employees were levered up. So the typical company doesn't have money saved up so that they can go a couple of months without revenue, yet still be able to pay their expenses. I mean, a normal economy, that would be the case. Companies would have a nice reserve of cash in case something goes wrong. I mean, if it's not coronavirus, I mean, a lot of different things can go wrong. And when you operate a business, you need to make sure that if those things go wrong, you're not out of business. So you maintain an adequate amount of reserves. Uh, And of course, if times go bad, you can furlough workers, right? And you can recall them when business picks up. Under a normal economy, workers can go a few months or longer without a paycheck because workers have savings. Because while they're working, they put money aside and they don't borrow money to, to buy stuff on a credit card. They don't borrow money uh, you know, to take vacations or, you know, to buy cars. They, they buy cars they can afford and they pay cash so they, 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 they can survive. Uh, but because of the Fed keeping interest rates so artificially low, everybody is living paycheck to paycheck. No, nobody can, can, can go any amount of time without that revenue coming in. And so all the corporations are failing. All the individuals can't pay their rent, can't pay their mortgages. This whole house of cards that the Federal Reserve has inflated with constant bailouts and stimulus, instead of allowing a solid economy uh, to replace the bubble, that's why we're in such bad shape now. Now, Peter, and, and all the yeah, Peter, real quick, I want to ask you because you know we uh, a lot of people get confused over the difference between money and actual wealth or what the money represents. Because someone I know someone listening right now is thinking. Well, what's the big deal if if the Fed and the Federal Reserve is like the, the the central bank of the country, and if they just if they print money to give to us, so now that we have money, why is that a bad thing? What's the difference between that and a normal paycheck that I would get for doing work? Yeah, well, because the paycheck is actually tied to the work, and and so the money has some relationship to the value that you added to society by doing work, because when you did work you created services or you help produce goods. And as a result, you now get money that is commensurate with what you added of value into a society. But if the money is just created and you don't do anything, if you don't add any uh, services, if you don't add any goods, then the money has no value. It's just paper. I mean, all money does is it enables everybody to allocate what's been produced. And the more you earn, the more you get to consume. It's like you have a greater claim on output. So let's say you, you, you set up a business and you produce all sorts of goods that benefit society that people get to buy. Uh, the profit that you earn now g- entitles you to go into society and, and, and buy stuff because you are taking out in proportion to what you put in, right? So money simply allows us to divide up what we've all collectively produced. But if we don't produce anything and we just have money, then what the money doesn't have any value. The, the money derives its value from the goods and services that we create, that we all agree we're going to allocate based on that monetary unit. Hmm. So all we're doing now is increasing the, uh, the demands for what's already there. We're, we're allowing people to bid higher prices to buy the goods and services that are already there. But, and the problem is because people are not working as much and not producing and not providing services, the supply of goods and services that we're collectively producing has declined. And, and then, and if we just add more money into that, then prices have to go way up. 
because we have less stuff to buy and more money to buy it with. Mm. So everybody just bids up prices and all the Fed is doing is creating inflation. And that doesn't benefit anybody. I mean, if what the Fed is doing worked, if we really could have all this stuff for free, then why did we wait for the coronavirus? I mean, why not just do it all the time? I mean, if there's no consequence, why are we even paying taxes? Why doesn't the government just print the money it needs and and just spend it, right? Mm. So it's so essentially, uh, if you have let's say ten dollars in circulation, and uh, you you know an apple is worth one dollar, and then we just put another ten dollars in circulation that's not tied to any anything that's uh, that we've made or produced, the the apple's value automatically in terms of dollars goes up. It's twice as much because now there's two times as many dollars in circulation. That's what inflation is. Oh, well, the value the value of the apple hasn't gone up. Right. The, the price of the apple's gone up. Yes. Great. Right now, Thank if you. if if at the same time we increased the supply of money, there were more apples because apple farmers grew more apples, well, then okay. Then the price of apples could stay the same. Uh, or if the money supply stayed the same and we just produce more apples, then the apple price would go down. Mm. And that would be a good thing because now we could buy more apples because we produce more of them. I mean, what determines uh, how much you can get of something is how much of that something that we can produce, right? So the more efficient farmers become at growing apples, right, the cheaper apples become and the more apples we all get to enjoy, mm. right? But if, 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 if the farmer doesn't grow any apples and we just print a bunch of money, the, the money doesn't create the apples. It's the apples that give purchasing power to the money, right? If, if we only have apples, even if there's no money, we could still eat the apples. We have to figure out another way to divvy them up. But it's the apples that have value. The paper money itself has no value. Now, when we have real money, like let's say we're using gold as money, right, instead of paper. Right. Well, gold requires effort to produce just like apples require effort to grow. And so when people are buying apples and they're paying with gold, they're exchanging one valuable commodity for another. Right. So in that sense, the money actually has value. But when you're talking about the fiat currency that we have now, that money has no value whatsoever. It costs nothing to make and you can do nothing with it. Right. If you can't spend your dollars, let's say, you know, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Gilligan's Island. Yeah. But, you know, if you get a bunch of castaways on an island, would it matter if somebody dumped a bunch of paper money, you know, on the island? I mean, I, I mean, other than if, other than maybe using it for fire, because maybe it'll <laughs> burn. I mean, having that paper isn't going to help you. What you need is stuff. Right. You need food or you need tools. Uh, the paper money doesn't doesn't have any value just just by itself. And, and, and so what gives that paper money value is the goods and services that we all produce and agree that we will exchange it for that paper. Now, money. Peter, you're explaining how uh, printing money, pumping it out, giving it to people, give it to companies will result in uh, inflation. In other words, the price of everything goes up, uh, the value stays the same or drops because we're producing less. And so you fix no problems. Now, we did a lot of this in uh, 2008 after the you know, the Great Recession. There was lots of money being pumped in, continued to be pumped in to the economy, printed money, uh, you know, not tied to anything. But we, 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 as a consumer, you know, if I'm just a regular guy consuming things, I didn't see prices inflate like crazy, or did we? Did we see inflation from the money that we've been pumping in since 2008? Are we already seeing these effects? Well, number one, we don't know what would have happened to prices, consumer prices, had the government not created all that money, had the oh, Fed not done QE1, 2, and 3. It's certainly possible that we could have seen a significant reduction in consumer prices, which would have benefited consumers who would have been able to buy more products for less money. And so the fact that inflation prevented prices from falling uh, is still a, a problem for the economy because we, we missed out on those benefits. But I still think that consumer prices rose more <clears throat> than what the official statistics reveal. Uh, but yes, we didn't have runaway inflation. It, you know, it wasn't really bad inflation. Um, and there was a couple of reasons for that. 
One is that the way the money entered the economy, the primary effect was on asset prices rather than consumer good prices. So if you look at what happened to the stock market, if you look at what happened to the bond market, to the real estate market, uh, those prices went way up. And so that was an effect of inflation. So if you wanted to buy stocks, they were a lot more expensive. If you wanted to buy a house, it was more expensive. If you wanted to buy bonds, the prices were more expensive. And so that was a consequence of inflation. But the other reason that we didn't see a bigger increase is because we, the United States, we are uh, creating the reserve currency, the U.S. dollar. And a lot of the dollars that we created ended up getting exported uh, and they were uh, used by the Chinese and the Japanese and everybody else to buy treasuries. Mm. But in exchange for the dollars that we sent to China and Japan, they sent us all sorts of consumer goods. So paper money went out and went into the bond market and all sorts of products went in and filled up the shelves on Walmart and Amazon. So we got all this stuff, but the money you know, went out. So that kept a lid on prices. But I think what's going to happen this time is the inflation is going to be more in consumer goods than financial assets. I don't think the Fed is going to be able to push up stock and real estate prices again the way it did before. And of course, what they're doing now is much bigger, right? The amount of money that is being printed now dwarfs what we did in 2008. So just because 2008 didn't produce a big increase in consumer prices doesn't mean that what they're doing now won't when what they're doing now is so much bigger, especially if this is the, is the nail in the dollar's coffin. If the dollar ends up crashing because the world is going to abandon it as the reserve currency and return to gold, which is what I think will happen, then all of those, all that paper money that the Chinese and the Japanese and the Saudis and the Russians and everybody else have been holding on to, all that money comes back, right? They start selling their treasuries and they get their dollars and they're like, you know what? We don't want to hold on to these dollars anymore. So let's buy something with them. And the only place their legal tender really is in America. So now what do the Chinese do with their dollars if they don't want to buy our bonds? They come in here and buy stuff. Mm. They'll buy property or they'll buy mm. used cars and they'll ship them back to China or they'll buy all sorts of stuff. And what they'll also stop doing is sending us stuff, right? Because we're not going to be exchanging dollars for goods anymore. So a lot of these goods that are being produced in Chinese factories, they're not going to be shipped to the United States. They're going to stay in China. And the Chinese consumers are going to buy those goods. Americans are going to go without those goods. So now the Fed's going to be cranking out all this money and the money's not going to get sent to China. It's going to stay here, but there's going to be nothing to buy because the Chinese aren't sending us their goods anymore. So prices could just go through the roof and we could just have massive inflation. So Peter, Peter, how does this, how does, how do you see this unfolding? Is it going to be, um, because you see things like, obviously we're infusing money right now. We also are putting holds on foreclosures. Is it going to be like a fall off the cliff thing? Or are we going to see this like slowly trickle and it's just going to continue to go down? What's your prediction? Well, maybe it'll be a slow tickle trickle until it becomes a complete waterfall. Um, but yeah, I mean, the things that we're doing now, uh, we're encouraging people not to pay rent. Uh, and, and so once people have skipped their rent for a few months, I mean, are they going to stop paying again? I mean, maybe uh, people are going to start to think of not paying rent as some kind of a civil right. Like, I, why should I have to pay rent? You know, yeah. I mean, I should be able to just live for free. You know, why should I have to have a job? I'll just keep getting these unemployment benefits, which are higher than what I got. And, you know, once the government, you know, starts giving something to voters, it's very hard to take it away. I mean, nobody wants to vote to take it away. So a three-month moratorium on evictions becomes a six-month moratorium, becomes a one-year moratorium. Mm -hmm. And once you know you can't be evicted, well, well why pay rent? What's the point? Mm. I mean, you know, you, you're not, you're not going to get evicted anyway. Uh, if you and if you if the bank can't foreclose on you if you don't pay your mortgage, well, then why pay your mortgage? Mm. No, no. Then why pay? You know, I mean, why pay anything? I mean, so the, the the government is creating this moral hazard, 
what we need to do is allow the free market to function. You know, they, they want to talk a lot about World War II and they try to compare this to World War II about sacrifice. But, you know, nobody got bails out, bailouts in World War II. Nobody got stimulus checks in World War II. What people got were tax increases. The government raised taxes massively during World War II, and Americans loaned money to the government, not the other way around. The government didn't loan any money to Americans. American citizens loaned the equivalent of trillions to the government so they could pay for the war. And, you know, a lot of businesses were interrupted. You know, when, when you take 15 million men, young men, and ship them off to war, those are 15 million men who aren't eating in restaurants. They're not taking their girls out on dates. They're not going to movies. They're not uh, staying in, in hotels. I mean, imagine what happened to the travel industry during World War II. The whole world is fighting. Nobody was going anywhere. So you had all these businesses that were completely interrupted, yet nobody got any bailout money. Mm. None. <laughs> so why, why can't we do that today? Because in 1941, we had a viable economy. Businesses had savings. Individuals had savings. Nobody was had credit card debt, student loans, auto loans. You know, we had a real economy, and so we could fight a real war. We had the resources to do it. We're broke now, thanks to decades of bad monetary and fiscal policy. This country was vulnerable to any crisis. If it wasn't the coronavirus, it'd have been something else. That's why I keep saying the coronavirus is the pin. The pin is not the problem. The problem is the bubble that the pin pricked and everybody wants to focus on the pin and they can't see the bubble because they're too busy looking at the pin. Mm. Now, now Peter, you're, what you're explaining is, you know, sound, uh, consistent. This is economic, uh, science. This is not, you're not saying anything that, uh, you're making up. This is how economics works. I mean, you, I have to believe that our government, the fed, the people that come up with our policy also understand basic economics. So my question to you is, why are they doing what they're doing? Is it because they're trying to kick the can down the road and hope that innovation and economic you know, production just offsets all this damage that they're doing? Like, why are they doing this? Because what you're saying, again, is basically... It's like you, it's like you take a math, you know, basic class. One plus one equals two. This isn't crazy stuff that you're saying. This is basic economics. They have to know this stuff. Why are they doing what they're doing? Well, first of all, don't assume that they know basic economics <laughs> because I think that's a bad assumption. Okay. In fact, a lot of people learned economics in college, and they learned it from a Keynesian professor and a Keynesian textbook, and and Keynesianism is kind of like astrology. You know, I mean, it's not it's not science. It's not like astronomy. So if you think, you know, economics because you studied Keynesianism, you don't know crap about economics. So it's possible that these guys don't actually know basic economics. They only think they do. But let's assume for the sake of argument that they're not all complete idiots. Right. And they actually understand, you know, what common sense when it comes to economics. The, the problem is. The political realities are that the average voter doesn't understand economics. And the way you get elected isn't by telling people, don't worry, the free market is going to function um, and there's nothing we could do to help. Uh, anything that we do will just make it worse. So, you know, you're just going to have to deal with your situation on your own, right? <laughs> yeah. That's not how people vote. You know, if you just say, look, I'm going to leave you alone and allow the market to work, uh, you know, that doesn't appeal to a voter like, oh, I'm going to send you a big check. I'm going to send you a check so that you're made whole. It's not your fault. So I'm going to make sure that you get bailed out. And, 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 and so that is what wins votes. And so when you look at how economic policy is being formulated, it's not about doing what's best for the country. It's about doing what's best for the incumbents who want to get reelected. But also, if you do the right thing economically, the immediate impact is always that the problem gets worse before it gets better. And it's that immediate uh, uh, impact that scares the hell out of the politicians who know that an election is right around the corner. And even if you know there's some long-term gain associated with that short-term pain, the politicians are worried that 
they won't be around in the long run because they'll, they'll lose the reelection during the short term pain. So their motivation is to kick the can down the road to try to get reelected, even if doing it makes it worse in the long run, because for them, it solves their short term reelection problem because everybody says, hey, how can the government just sit back and let people lose their jobs, let businesses fail? Well, if they do that, the economy will emerge from the decline quicker and healthier. And in the long run, fewer businesses will end up failing and fewer people will lose their jobs and will have a more productive economy. But if the government intervenes in the way it's doing, it will slow down the pain, but ultimately elongate it and make it worse because in the long run, even more people will lose their jobs and even more businesses will fail because of the government's efforts to prop them up and eliminate all of the good things that the free market is trying to do, right? The free market is trying to rebalance the economy. It's trying to cleanse the economy of inefficient businesses that are wasting capital and wasting resources and, you know, and, and reward the prudent and punish the, the reckless and, 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 and do all these good things. It's like, you know, if, if, um, if somebody is uh, out of shape and overweight, right? To, you know, get into something that maybe is it makes sense, right, to the audience. <laughs> if somebody is really out of shape, uh, they 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 smoke, they drink, uh, they don't exercise, you know, and they're just you know out of shape. And you say, okay, I got a, I got I got a solution for you. This is what you have to do. You're going to stop eating all this junk food. Uh, you're going to go on a diet. And you're going to exercise. You're going to do cardio. You're going to do weights. You're going to do all this stuff. And, and, and the guy's like, well, but what if I do all that stuff? I'm going to have to give up all this stuff I like. I mean, I love eating. I love picking out uh, on junk food before I go to bed. And I, I you know, and, and I, I don't want to exercise. I mean, that's going to, I mean, that, that's too tiring. I'd rather, you know, so, um, so there's this short term pain, right? If somebody does that and, in the long run, right, they're much better off. They could get healthy. They could live longer. They could enjoy life more. There's a lot of benefits to being in shape. But in order to get that way, you have to make some changes that are disruptive. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens is a politician comes along and says, oh, you don't have to do any exercise. You don't have to diet. Just take this pill. This will just make you lose weight in your sleep. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds great. You know, I don't want I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this stuff. Um, you know, they, they, they want to they promise gain with no pain. Right. Now, you, but, you know, it, it doesn't work. Now, you, and it, it, great analogy, Peter. But I'm, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a counter to you because I, I, I guarantee someone listening right now is thinking, okay, 1941, uh, money went full fiat, meaning it's, it's not connected to anything now. They can print as much as they want. But 1971. Sorry, 1971. 19, it went full, yeah. right? Okay. But objectively speaking, whether you go back from 1941, 1971, whatever, objectively speaking, today, life is easier, it's better, we got more stuff, uh, it costs less for the most part. So why then, if all this, we've had this bad policy, this, these, this, this bad economic policy, how come then life has objectively just still gotten better? Is it in spite of the policies? I mean, what's going on? What, why are we better off then still? All right. Well, first of all, I won't even accept the premise that we're necessarily better off. I mean, some of us are clearly, uh, and that is despite government, not because of government, because yes, we have had a lot of uh, technological advancements, uh, you know, over the past 50 years. I believe that we would have, have had even more technological advancements had we had less government, had we been more free, had we paid lower taxes, had we had less uh, uh, regulation. I think scientific achievement, industrial achievement would have been much greater. But still, despite everything that the government has done, we have still managed to improve on our knowledge and our uh, efficiencies you know, than, than what we had you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And of course, we've been living beyond our means, right? One of the reasons that people live a better life is because they're indulging themselves today. I mean, nobody has anything saved for retirement. So you could go back and look at American life, let's say as late as the 1960s, early 1960s. Um, people were saving for their retirement. So they, they had money you know, to retire. 
in the in the interim, if you were a guy, a typical guy uh, in 1960, 1950, 40, even if you didn't even graduate high school, you could earn enough money to get married, support your wife who did not have a job. She did not have to work. She stayed home. She, you know, she did the cooking and the cleaning and maybe even had a house help. Uh, so you could support that woman, that wife on your blue collar job, right? That you didn't even go to college for. And you could have two or three kids, four kids. You could raise them. You didn't have to borrow any money. You had no credit cards. Uh, you know, you, 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 you made enough money to actually be able to support your family on your income without going into debt, <laughs> you know, and you could also save for retirement. So today that's impossible. Even the average college grad can't support a wife today. So he, the wife has to have a job just to be able to, to pay the rent or to pay the mortgage. And they're doing that with debt, even with both people working, even with a husband and wife, both working full-time jobs. Sometimes they're working two jobs. They still have no savings. Mm. They're still on debt. Whereas a guy in 1950 did all that without his wife and without the debt. Uh, and, and so are we really better off now than we were despite all of the technology? And in fact, if you go back and you look at the changes in America, from like 1900 to 19, or let's say 1890 or to 1950 or 19, you know, compared to from 1950 to now or whatever this 1880, whatever this similar set period is, life improved much more back then, mm. right? If you looked at Amer if you looked at America in 1880, right, versus 1950, nobody had electricity. Nobody had cars. Nobody had air conditioning. No one had telephones. Uh, there was no movies. Uh, you know, I mean, people in 1880 didn't live much different than people lived in 1680 or 1480. I mean, there, but all of a sudden, you know, we started to have a free market revolution. We had sound money. We were on a. We ended the Civil War. Right. We we're on a gold standard, limited government, and we had this industrial revolution where people now have electricity indoor plumbing, you know, they have, they have refrigeration, they have air conditioning, they have telephones, they have uh, airplanes, they have cars. I mean, I mean, if you took somebody in a time machine from 1880 to 1950, they would be completely amazed at everything they saw. I mean, it would be, oh my God, it would be unbelievable the difference in the quality of life uh, between reading by candles and having to go to bathroom in an outhouse and, you know, and having no, I mean, to, I mean, to all the things to, to, to the just going into a kitchen in 1950 with all those appliances that none of them existed. People, I mean, they didn't have larger machines. They didn't have dishwashers. All that stuff was here in 1950. The only real difference between 1950 and now is we have cell phones uh, and we have personal computers. Um, but, you know, other than that, we don't have. It's not that much different as far as life, the the, the, the improvement in in life. And if you figure that we're working a lot harder and we have a lot less to show for it, so you know we could be so much richer than we are if uh, we had maintained that trajectory. Like I like to, I used to watch this show uh, called The Jetsons. Oh, when yeah. I was a kid, nineteen sixties, <laughs> and so when they wrote this, when they wrote the sixties, they, they they made this. Uh, Hanna Barbera made the cartoon. They just assumed that life would continue to evolve the way it did. So in the future, George Jetson, who is the husband, right? Judy, his wife, she doesn't have a job, and George only works two days a week, right? For like four hours a day, and he like was like, oh, these two day work weeks are killing me. I pushed the button like eight times. <laughs> You know, like, like, you know, um, work, people are working less, right? People are enjoying more leisure and more freedom because we've continued to advance our technology and make capital investments that free up labor so that people don't have to work as much. That is the idea. That is the goal of society. I mean, it's not a goal that anybody is orchestrating on their own, but ultimately what capitalism does is it replaces 
labor with machines so that all of us don't have to work as hard and we can have more leisure. We can have we we can we can do the things in life that we enjoy, not the stuff that we have to do because the, we can produce more. And we get more goods, we get more services with less human effort going into it. And then everybody benefits from the abundance of goods that are produced, goods and services. Mm. Uh, but, you know, what's happening now is we're not, we're, we're not doing that. We're trying to figure out how we don't want, we want to make sure that we're all working hard. I mean, that is not what people want. People don't want to work hard. They want, they want to work as little as possible and have as much as possible. And that free markets ultimately do that. And we were moving in that direction. I mean, that's what got, that's why women stopped working. You know, once upon a time, women had to work. So did men. You know, ch children used to have to work. The, the reason that children stop working isn't because of child labor laws. No, it's because that their parents or their father was able to become more productive based on the gains in productivity from the free market that the kids didn't have to work anymore. That, that's what happened. You know, that's why you still have child labor in some countries. It's not because their parents are mean. It's because it's the only way they could feed them. So, Peter, if you if let's say, because I, I think we would both agree that um, we don't have a lot of faith in the government shrinking, then that's what it would take. Right. It would take government having to shrink. And that's probably not going to happen based off of what we've seen for the last few decades, for sure. So if there was somebody during this time who was a little more prudent and saved a hundred thousand dollars and they're not freaking out right now how would you advise them to invest knowing what you know and what you probably predict is going to happen with government yeah, that's, a, that's a great question because the what i'm getting from you is save your money but i'm also getting from you money's going to be worthless so what do you do what do you do you got a hundred grand you want to invest yeah actually absolutely because the key to economic growth is savings. Savings is what provides the capital uh, for businesses to expand and, and invest in the equipment uh, and, and, and create the jobs that uh, delivers prosperity. But what the government is doing is destroying savings. And so the economy is going to implode when you have a, a war on savings. And, you know, government shrinking is, yes, it's extremely important because that's the only way out of a recession is to reduce the burden that government places on an economy. Uh, by cutting spending. And so if the government really wanted to help, they would make itself smaller by cutting spending and, and reducing regulations so that the economy uh, would be better able uh, to get us out of this mess uh, by freeing up resources back to the private sector that would be able to be used productively. But none of that is going to happen. So what you have to understand is if you are in the minority of people who actually did do it right, right, you have savings, you are going to be taxed through inflation to bail out all the people who have debt and don't have savings. That is what happens. So when the government prints up all this money and sends it to the unemployed and sends it to businesses, where is the purchasing power coming from? It's being taken from the people who already have money, right? So the government has two ways of taxing you. The legitimate way is by actually taking your money in taxes. Like you have $100 and the government says, we're going to take 30 and we're going to use it uh, to, to, to spend on, on stuff, right? So you had 100, the government takes 30, you got 70 left. Well, what if the government doesn't take the 30? They just print money and spend it. Well, now your $100 feels like $70 because prices have gone up to the point where you've, you've lost 30% of your purchasing power. So there's no free lunch. The government is going to get you one way or the other. And so the way they're taxing everybody, the way they're taxing the prudent to bail out the reckless is through inflation. And the good news, though, is that the inflation tax is avoidable, at least for now, right? It's not illegal. You can get rid of your dollars that are about to depreciate and convert them into something else, right? You can buy gold. And as the dollar goes down in value, the price of gold will go up. So instead of having... Uh, you know, a thousand dollars of gold, you know, you now end up with 1500 or 2000. So you can afford the higher prices. So the government's not taxing the people who own gold because they're not printing gold. They're only taxing the people who have dollars. So avoid the tax by getting out of the dollar. And so you can buy gold. We, we, I sell physical gold at Chip Gold. Uh, 
But also, if you have a bigger portfolio and you don't want to just have it in a non-income producing asset, what I am helping people do is I'm building portfolios of good, solid businesses in Singapore, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Hong Kong, in Switzerland, in Norway, in other countries that I think on, the, on a scale are far more fiscally responsible than the United States that are not going to see a destruction of their currency. Their economies are in much better shape. And if you own income producing assets in those countries, you will have a viable portfolio that will rise by more than the domestic inflation rate and which will provide you with an income stream that will increase as the dollar loses value so that you won't be taxed through inflation. Because as prices go up, because the dollar is going down, your dividends in Norwegian krona, in Swiss francs, in New Zealand dollars, those dividends are buying more and more U.S. dollars. Hmm. So now as you get your dividend checks, you have more money to buy the more expensive goods. Whereas if you stayed in the dollar, you'd have the same amount of money and then you'd have to buy fewer goods because the price of goods would be going up. So, yeah, I mean, people have to act quickly to protect themselves. And that's what I'm doing at my brokerage firm at Euro Pacific Capital. People should, you know, europac.com. You should reach out to me, talk to my uh, brokers about getting your accounts transferred over to us, funding accounts, moving over retirement accounts, and getting out of U.S. financial assets, particularly bonds, but also U.S. stocks, which remain very overvalued, and prepare yourself to escape this inflation tax, mm. uh, because it is going to wipe out uh, the retirement of so many Americans. We talked about you know women entering you know the workforce. The, the the real entry where women really started to work was in the 1970s, and the reason that that happened was because when we went off the gold standard in 1971, the dollar lost about two thirds of its value. Right, the Deutsche Mark went from. Um, um, four, you could buy four marks to the dollar. It went down to one and a half. The Swiss franc went from 23 cents. You could buy a Swiss franc from 23 cents. It went up to 75 cents in that decade. Uh, you used to, you, you got 360 Japanese yen for $1 in 1971. By 1980, you, you were only getting about 150, right? So the dollar went way down. That's why oil prices went up so much. Oil went from $3 a barrel to $30 a barrel. The reason that happened, it wasn't because OPEC jacked up prices is because we tried to buy oil with paper instead of gold. And so once we started giving paper, well, the, the price went up. And so prices went up. But what happened was wages did not go up nearly as much as prices. And so what happened was now all of a sudden, the husband, based on the big increase in prices, his pay wasn't enough to support his wife anymore. So the wife now had to go get a job. Right. It wasn't because of women's lib that all these women started working. They were liberated when they didn't have to work. The minute they were forced to work, they lost that liberty. And, and, and so it was a reduction in the standard of living when now all of a sudden the kids have to fend for themselves. There's no one taking care of the house. I mean, and I'm not like a male chauvinist. I mean, it's fine if the man wants, to, if the woman wants to work and the guy wants to take care of the house and the kids, okay. Uh, you know, but if if nobody can take care of the house and the kids because everybody is forced to work, I don't think that's a, 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 an achievement. I don't think that's something that we should think is an advancement. I think that is a a reduction in our our our, our quality of life. I agree. But I think what's going to happen this time, right, is that it's not just women are going to start working because they're already working. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to send the kids to work and take them <laughs> out of school. But the other thing that's going to change dramatically is retirement is going to be a thing of the past. I mean, you know, because if, if, if you look at a movie, if, you, if some of your kids will watch, you look, you're watching something from the 1950s and, you know, they see the mom at home, like, oh, well, well, why isn't she at work? Oh, well, 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 there was once a time mothers didn't work. They, they, they were able to stay at home. And when the kids came home from school, they were there and they were doing, you know, because it, it looks very foreign. Uh, to most kids, because you know they, they all they know is their moms have have jobs just like their dads. There's no difference. Well, I think at some point in the future, uh, you know, people might look at a movie from this time period and they'll see an older person who's not at work. Hey, why is that? What's that guy doing? He's just he's just playing golf in the middle of the day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because once upon a time when 
when people got old, they retired and they, oh, what's that? What's that? What does that mean? You know, they, they stopped working because the, the inflation is going to destroy the value of everybody's savings, everybody's pensions, everybody's Social Security benefits. So nobody is going to retire. The money is going to retire. Peter, you said something earlier, and I want to take you back to it um, so the audience uh, could get a better understanding. Could you give us a quick economic lesson on the difference between uh, Keynesian philosophy versus like free market philosophy and economics? Or Austrian, right? Right, yeah. So if, yeah. if, if they're if obviously they're teaching it in schools, I have a friend that actually has his degree and we argue all the time. I'm a free market guy. And he, him and I go back and forth and he's got the degree in economics. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that the reason is, is because this is how he was taught. Could you school me and our audience on really what the fundamental differences are between those two? Yeah, well, I mean, there are a couple of easy differences to grasp. So Austrian economics uh, is more, uh, it looks more at the, the individual and the, the ability of free people to be productive uh, and, and in pursuing their self-interest, uh, helping everybody else uh, through, you know, Adam Smith, the invisible hand. I mean, it's very much a classical view of economics that focuses on production, savings, and supply, right? That the key to uh, a, a rising standard of living is producing more things and being efficient and being productive. And that, uh, so that you, you're looking at how, how, is, how are things being produced? How do businesses produce more stuff so that we all can consume more, right? And so you're looking at it from the supply side and you're looking at it from uh, the individual, the entrepreneur uh, uh, angle. And, and, and Austrians see money as just another commodity, a mother good when money is gold, right? They look at it, uh, a, a, a money as a commodity that you exchange for other commodities or the, the, way, the way I described it when it comes to fiat money. But the Keynesians look at government as an enabler of prosperity that uh, and the way they do this is through increasing demand right they they don't look at problems in economics as an absence of supply they look at it as an absence of demand right there's just not enough demand people don't aren't buying enough we need more buying and so they want to focus on things that stimulate demand and they think, well, let's have government spend money. Let's have government print money. And we're going to have demand. And But what they don't understand is demand without supply means nothing. And they don't understand the difference between the legitimate demand and desire. Because you don't have to stimulate desire. I mean, everybody wants everything, right? It's not like I need to be stimulated to want stuff. I want all kinds of things. The limiting factor is what I can afford. And, 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 and the government can't make things more affordable by creating money. What makes things more affordable is greater production that brings down the cost, right? When, when, when cell phones first came out, if you remember the first cell phone uh, in the 1980s, really, uh, these things cost thousands of dollars to buy back then. And, and to use them was very expensive. I mean, I remember when I got my first cell phone, I, I barely used it. You know, because and if someone called me, I would be really quick because it was so expensive <laughs> to make the call. Um, but what increased the demand for cell phones wasn't people wanting them more because everybody wanted one. It was a question of, you know, could you afford it? What the reason everybody has them now isn't because the demand for cell phones went up. It's because the price went down because production went up because businesses became so much more efficient at producing cell phones that they became affordable to everybody. It wasn't just Gordon Gecko who could afford a cell phone. It was everybody. It was his maid that could afford a cell phone. And, and so the Austrians recognize a basic economic principle that supply is what creates demand that you can't demand something that hasn't first been produced. And so government can't stimulate production by stimulating demand. Demand gets stimulated all by itself, simply through the productive process. And if there's a bunch of goods that aren't being consumed, all that has to happen is the price has to be allowed to fall. And now they're going to get bought. You know, you don't have to print more money 
to stimulate those sales. Just let prices come down to the point where people could afford it. I bet you have uh, Keynesians now. They seem to think that the worst thing that can happen to prices is that they go down. Yeah, right? They think, oh, we need government to prevent prices from going down. Why? Prices, you know, they, they try to argue that, well, you know, if prices go down, nobody will buy anything, which is a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> I just talked about cell phones. I mean, the reason that we're buying cell phones is because the price went down. I remember the first time I saw a high def television. I walked into like a good guy's yeah, or one like of these $10, places. $10,000 back and I, then. I, it was still, it was 10000 The yeah. first one I saw was $10,000. And it wasn't even a big screen. It was maybe like 28 inches. I don't remember, 32 inches. And it was $10,000. But I remember looking at it and I was amazed. I was like, it's like looking through a window, right? Compared to the what I had back then, I really would have liked that television set. But I didn't want to spend $10,000 to buy. I didn't like it that much. <laughs> was it $10,000? You know, the first television sets that came out in the 1940s, the sets themselves were like a huge piece of furniture, but the screen was about two or three inches. It was only black and white. And the first television set was as much money as a car. Mm. Who the, I mean, you know, who bought it? Really, really rich people that bought it just so they could tell their friends. They and you know, what, what could you watch? There was like two hours of programming uh, on CBS, you know, and you had to watch within a certain window of time to even see it. I mean, but now everybody has multiple TVs because they're dirt cheap, right? So the idea that nobody will buy television sets if the prices go down is nonsense. The only reason we all have them is because the price goes down. Everybody who buys a computer today knows if they just wait a year, they can buy a better one for less money. So why do people buy computers? Because they don't want to wait a year. They want it right now. The Keynesians, the Keynesians don't understand the time value of things. They think that we will wait indefinitely to buy something at a lower price if we think the price is going to go down. No. The only reason people don't buy something waiting for a lower price is because they can't afford it. And so they wait for the price to come down to the point where they can afford it. But if the price never goes down, they'll never buy because they'll never be able to afford it. Peter, you know, this, so you're talking about electronics right now. Why is it that the price of things like electronics for, you know, quality is just gone down tremendously? I mean, the first, like you said, the first Walkman was 300 and something dollars in those dollars. You, you adjust for inflation. It's like $800. I could probably go find a, a, a cassette player on, on Amazon right now for, for five or 10 bucks. Why is it that electronic prices have gone down, but the cost of things like education and healthcare has exploded? Well, because education and healthcare are heavily subsidized by the U.S. government. So anything that the U.S. government gets involved in, the price is going to go up. I mean, that's how government works. They subsidize things. Uh, you know, if the government was involved in consumer electronics, the same thing would be happening. I mean, if the government was guaranteeing loans so that people can borrow money to buy c computers, computer prices would have gone up instead of down mm -hmm. and people would have all kinds of debt, you know, uh, related to this. I mean, you can see if you look at medicine, because it's really easy because you could take a look at medicine where the government is involved and where it's not. You could take a look at um, cosmetic procedures. Like you could look at orthodonture, right? What it costs to put braces on your kid's teeth. Braces today are a fraction of what they cost 20, 30, 40 years ago. The same thing with eye LASIK surgery, which you know you can get your, your eyes fixed at a fraction of the cost of what the same procedure cost 20, 30 years ago. And even all cosmetic procedures, you know, breast implants, you know, liposuction, all this stuff is cheaper. And the reason is because there is a free market in it. You, there is no government subsidy uh, to get these procedures. There's no insurance and third party payer, which is you know only there because of government's uh, ta the tax law where people get insurance tax free. You know, if you have a job and your employer pays you a salary, you pay income taxes. But if he gives you insurance, it's tax free. So that has created a, a, a an artificial uh, demand for people to prefer insurance to cash. And so then instead of uh, getting cash and then buying medical care, they get insurance and then they run everything through a third party, which has dramatically increased uh, the cost of, of, of basic medical care. I mean, things that used to be very inexpensive, uh, you know, 
back in the 1940s and 1950s. I mean, if, you know, if, you know, you, you know, you had a baby, you know, you could go to the hospital, you know, for two weeks and, 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 and have, uh, and have a baby and the average guy could afford it. No problem. I mean, you didn't need insurance. And, and now you go and you're, you get a baby, you're out of the hospital the next day because it's so damn expensive. And, you know, it costs, you know, like a brand new car because everybody pays for it with insurance. I mean, if things, medical treatment used to be inexpensive in this country before the government got involved in subsidizing it. The same thing with, with education. You know, I mean, my father went to college. He didn't borrow any money to go to college. Uh, and, and he came from a relatively poor family. So how did my father pay for college? He had a summer job. He waited tables over the summers and that's all it took. And based on doing that, he could pay all of his tuition, all of his room and board. Uh, it didn't cost his parents any money. And he worked his way through college, uh, just like most of his friends. I mean, that was a common thing to work your way through college if your parents couldn't afford to pay. And by the way, it wasn't expensive. So if your parents were upper middle class, it was no big deal to pay for college. But if they were lower middle class or upper lower class, you know, all right, the kids got a job. It was no big deal. Why is college so expensive today? Because the government is so heavily involved in subsidizing college and in guarantee, you know, in paying for college and lo making loans for college. But, you know, if the government was not involved in any way in college, if you if there was no government uh, scholarships, if there were no government guaranteed loans, college would be much cheaper today than it was when my dad went because of all of the advances that there's been, I mean, when my dad went to college, they didn't even have photocopy machines. I mean, let alone computers. I mean, I, 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 they were so inefficient back then. If you take a look at all the tools we have today, plus a lot more people are going to college now than when my dad went. When my dad went to college, probably 10% of the high school grads went to college. Now it's probably, what, 50% or 60%, something like that. There's something called economies of scale. If when my dad went to college, the average class had, you know, 50 people, and now the average lecture has 500 people, it should be cheaper per person. <laughs> if, we're, if we're educating a lot more people, then the cost per person should be going way down, not up, especially when you consider all of the advancements that colleges have today to make them more efficient that did not exist 70 years ago. Mm. So if you got government completely out of education, college tuition would implode. It would be so cheap to go. <laughs> it's only government. Anything the government gets involved in, you can see it. It becomes extremely expensive. The free market lowers costs and increases quality. The government does the opposite. It reduces quality and increases cost. So, Peter, do you do you think it's possible? I have this philosophy or this this theory that I have that I've shared on the show before, and I don't know how sound it is, and I would love to hear you comment on it. That you know, I, I believe so strongly in the free market that it'll it'll find its way still, even if government still keeps trying to get involved. And I think we see an example of that in the Silicon Valley right now, where we live, where you have. Facebook, Apple, Google, and they're building these, they're building these massive, almost uh, their own economy where they have grocery stores and dentists and uh, doctors and lawyers and uh, movie theaters all on campus. And what is to stop a company like Google or Apple that has employees, let's say the average income, I think at Google is like 200 and something thousand dollars. So they, they are making 200,000 uh, US dollars right now, but what does this stop them from saying, would you like 200,000 US dollars or would you rather have 10,000 US dollars and we'll give you uh, 300,000 Google dollars, which you can use to spend anywhere on any of our campus, which supplies basically all the things that you would normally like. What is to stop a company from doing something like that? Well, I mean, obviously any private company could create a superior form of currency to the US dollar. Right. I mean, anybody could do that. I mean, well, like what if McDonald's came out and said, we're going to have a McDonald's buck and this buck is good for one hamburger, no matter what. Right. So at least, you know, that you can get a hamburger. It's, it's backed by a hamburger. They have enough locations that, right. you know, you take your dot, you get a hamburger. And even if you don't eat hamburgers, you know, you could, somebody wants them. And so you can, you can exchange it. Right. 
uh, you know, because the, the, what we have now is backed by nothing. Right. That's why I think and this it is would possible. be nice. I mean, airlines could issue currency backed by frequent fire miles. I mean, any company could, that, that that's big enough that you have confidence is not going to go out of business can issue a currency that could circulate as a medium of exchange. And people could decide, you know, what they want to be paid in, right? Mer- merchants could decide, yes, I trust Google Bucks. I trust McDonald Bucks. I trust any of these currencies. And they can circulate. Uh, but the only thing that stops that is the government because the government doesn't like competition. So the minute you create money, the government you know, comes at you like you're some kind of terrorist. And there's all sorts of rules and regulations that would basically make it prohibitively expensive for anybody to do that. You know, so it's just like, you know, if, if, if somebody decides they want to deliver mail, if, if a neighborhood kid decides that he wants to get on his bicycle and deliver mail and compete with the post office, the government's going to put him out of business. They, it's illegal. You can't compete with the post office. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, and the same thing is on money. It's illegal. The government doesn't want anybody competing with the Fed. Uh, because it would be so easy to compete with the Fed because their product sucks. You know? <laughs> they, their product their product does not meet, retain its value. Mm. I mean, it would be very easy for anybody, any company to say, hey, I've got gold in a vault and I'm going to come up with money that's backed by this gold. And then you could just circulate it. I mean, that people would trust that. And then it would, you know, you, you know, it would maintain its value. Well, that's why but I don't feel have- how they could stop. How could they stop Apple or Google or Facebook from doing something like that if they make it just that simple where it's you work? Well, you, well, you, because you put them in jail for a long time <laughs> for, mon- for money laundering. Yeah. Because here's what, because of the Patriot Act, it all started at, with 9 11 and the Patriot Act. But, um, you have all these rules on anti-money laundering. So what the government would say is, okay, let's say Google creates money. They're going to say, how do you know that some drug dealer isn't using this money? How do you know that some terrorist isn't using this money? That's what they say. But they really don't give a damn about terrorists or money launderers. They really care about tax evasion, right? They really think of, hey, what if somebody uses your money and they don't report the income exactly. and we miss out on some tax revenue. So what they say is we need you to put into place the procedures so you can track every single transaction that takes place with this money because we want it, We want you to make sure that everybody who's using your money is paying their taxes. Well, how the hell are you going to do that? And then they're going to say if we find that you didn't see a red flag, that somebody who's evading their taxes or who may evade taxes is using your money and you didn't do enough to ferret that out, you're going to jail for 20 years. You know, we're going to fine you $5 million and put you in jail. Some of the biggest penalties that exist today are for not doing enough to stop money laundering. Mm. I mean, it's one of the worst things. I mean, much worse than armed robbery or, or rape. I mean, the penalties for just not spying on your customers, you know, are really, really high. <laughs> So, so that, that's the. Problem. I feel like there's still loopholes for this. I feel like if, if if it's not money you create, it's just you provide a service of all these things that you know it allows you to. As long as you don't, as long as you don't allow it to be transferred. See, the minute you allow the value to be transferred, now you've created a medium of exchange. You've created a currency. And now you're subject to money laundering. and Let's take out transfer and just say that when you now work for our company that you get to go to the movies at least twice a, a week. You get to go to the grocery store at least once a week. You get to go to the dentist once a year. And that, like they just put a package together and it's a free quote unquote service. And we just pay you less per year. Yeah. How do they pay those people though? That's the other yeah, question. I mean, they could do that unless the IRS says that you have to include the value of those services mm. as part of your compensation and, play, and pay taxes on it i mean because the problem is is that yeah. the government has can legislate and they got the guns so <laughs> they could do whatever they want yeah. and and they don't and if if you're out competing them they can shut you down my, i have a question for you uh, about you know after 2008 you know unprecedented amount of money pumped into the economy lots of people ran to gold because it's a great protection against the 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 the, the devalue of the dollar gold's price went through the roof everybody expected the dollar to crash but it didn't in fact the dollar's value actually did better later on and gold kind of fluctuates depending on if people want how did that happen why didn't the dollar why didn't the dollar just keep going down at that point why did it kind of stay because i remember 
going to Europe and you know the, the dollar's value after 2008 was a, it was a little while after that it was actually worth more when compared to the euro for example how come it didn't crash in value well first of all you have to realize that the price of gold in 2001 was at 260 270 dollars an ounce and so by 2011 it went all the way up to 1900 yeah so it had a huge rise and you know it so by then it was entitled to a pullback and the lowest gold got was 1050 in december of 2015 so it the lowest it got was about four or five times where it started to rise. Oh. So gold had a big move, right? People forget how much gold moved up leading up to and during the earlier part of the 08 financial crisis. Also, the dollar fell precipitously from uh, 2001 to 2008. In fact, in 2008, the dollar was at an all-time record low against the yen, against the euro, against the Swiss franc. So the dollar was extremely weak. And it was only from that very, very weak position that the dollar rose. And all of the dollar's gains, or most of them, took place in 2013. That was the that was the big year uh, of, of dollar gain uh, and into 2014. And the reason for that was that's when Europe started to do QE and they started to do some uh. of the bad things that we did. So that made the dollar look better by comparison. But more importantly, the Fed was out there talking about how great everything was. Everybody was agreeing that, hey, uh, QE worked. And the Fed was saying, okay, we're going to shrink our balance sheet back to normal. We're going to normalize interest rates. Everything is fine. And so the market started to look ahead to normal interest rates. They started to look ahead mm -hmm. to the Fed returning its balance sheet back below a trillion. So they were going to sell all these bonds, sell all these mortgages. They were going to shrink the money supply. The dollar was going to become scarce as all these dollars that the Fed created temporarily were going to be destroyed. And so the markets began to factor all that stuff in. Well, none of that was true. I was saying at the time that this is BS. The Fed is never going to do this. It's impossible to do what they're claiming they're going to do. They're going to go back to QE. They're going to go back to zero. I said that the whole time. Well, obviously, I've been proven right. The Fed is back at zero. QE4, and in fact, I always said that QE4 would be bigger than one, two, and three combined. And it's you know it, it already is, and it's just getting started. Uh, but um, the um, now... I don't think anybody is going to believe that the Fed is ever going to be able to shrink its balance sheet back to normal, that the Fed is ever going to be able to return interest rates to normal, because the more debt we have, the bigger the balance sheet gets, the harder it is to actually do that. And if they couldn't shrink a four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet, how on earth are they going to shrink a 10 trillion dollar balance sheet? If they couldn't normalize interest rates when the national debt was 20 trillion, how are they going to do it when it's 40 trillion, right? It's mm -hmm. just, it's even more impossible uh, to do. And so then people are going to realize that the Fed has now trapped itself into a spot where once price inflation gets going, the Fed has no tools to combat it. Because mm. the only way the Fed can fight inflation is by shrinking the money supply and raising interest rates. But that's something they'll never do because if they do that, they create a financial crisis where there's no bailouts, where everybody fails and everybody gets wiped out, which we know they're not going to do. So the cat's going to be out of the bag. People are going to realize that the dollar is a one-way ticket down, that it's only a question of time before it's worthless. And, and it's going to drop like a stone and there's nobody that's going to buy it. It's just, you know, there's no one's going to get fooled into thinking that the Fed can raise rates. Uh, so the dollar just is going to be a bottomless pit. And, you know, it, 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 the, 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 you know, the worst thing that you can do is be the, la the last one left holding the bag. I mean, the mm. first the first people out are going to have the best position. So gold, so gold, silver, probably good investments. What about assets? What about buying things like uh, property? Um, you know, uh, you know, land and stuff like that. Do you think that would be smart as a way to kind of protect yourself or hedge against what seems to be at some point inevitable? Yeah, well, that's exactly what I mentioned earlier. That's what I'm helping my clients do at Europe Pacific Capital is to buy real assets, to buy land through property trusts. We own land in Singapore and New Zealand, places like that, uh, commercial property, industrial property, uh, agricultural land. Uh, that makes sense. <clears throat> 
Uh, but it doesn't make sense to buy a lot of assets in America. It makes sense to buy assets abroad. And the reason for that is, if I'm correct, America is going to be a much poorer nation in the future than it is today. And as a result, assets in America are going to have less value relative to assets in wealthier countries, right? It only makes sense, right? Real estate is a function of how much you can sell it for or what you can rent it for, right? Well, we, rich people can pay higher rent than poor people. So if you own a piece of property surrounded by poor people, uh, you can't rent it out for very much money. Hmm. But if you have a property where you have a lot of rich people, they'll, they, they'll pay higher rent. So I want to find the countries that are going to be richer in the future, and I want to buy my real estate there. I don't want to buy my real estate in countries that are going to be poorer in the future because now my real estate is going to have less value. Now, if it's a particular piece of property, like it's oceanfront property in Hawaii, maybe on Maui, okay, well, rich people can always buy that, right? It's, it's, it's not, you know, but if you're talking about in, in, in the heartland, like somewhere in a suburb of Indiana, I mean, no Japanese tycoon wants to buy a vacation house, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So you, that, that real estate is only going to be a function of the real income of the people that's, that are in, you know, commuting distance of that house. And, you know, so, and, and I think when you have massive inflation and people are spending uh, a lot of their money on food and a lot of their money on energy and, and, and stuff like that, they don't have money left over to pay their rent. Right. So rents are going to come down. And when everybody is renting out their basement and renting out their attic, when everybody has two or three roommates and several families are living in the same house because that's the way they can cut their costs. I mean, look, this is going to be a disaster. Uh, for the U.S. So you don't want to invest in the U.S. now. When you want to invest in the U.S. is after everything crashes, when everything is really a mess. And then if we finally see the error of our ways and have free market reforms and shrink government and cut government spending and create the foundation for a free market led savings uh, and investment recovery, then you come back and you buy up all these assets real cheap. That's what you do. But you don't you don't buy them now. Well, what what worries me is that it'll be blamed on capitalism, and instead of running towards the more market, what'll end up happening is we'll run towards uh, stronger central government. Which historically, when you see crashes, you know that tends to happen. You tend to get stronger, more tyrannical central government. Which actually, brings oh yeah, I mean. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's what happened in 2008. Uh, because I remember, you know, in 2008, Congress uh, had a commission. And the commission was to look into why the financial crisis happened, right? That was the whole idea. And I tried very, you know, much. I had, I kept writing and I had people call. I wanted to testify at those hearings because I knew exactly why the financial crisis happened because I predicted it for the exact reasons that it happened. I went through the housing bubble and how it was being created and what was going to happen. I mean, I nailed that crisis. I have not seen anybody explain the crisis better after it happened than my explanations years before it happened. So I was like, okay, I'm the, I'm the one that predicted the crisis and I'm, I'm commonly credited as being the guy that forecast it. Can I testify as to why the crisis happened? No, they wouldn't let me there. <laughs> the only people who were allowed to testify were people who said we had a crisis because we didn't have enough government. We had too much capitalism. We had too much free markets that if only we had more regulations, that it wouldn't have happened. And that, of course, was the opposite is true. Had we had free market regulations, it wouldn't have happened. But because the government interrupted the, the natural regulations of the market, uh, it created the bubble and, and created the crisis. Uh, and, and so, yes, the government always creates a crisis by interfering with capitalism. And then when the crisis happens, they blame the crisis on capitalism, not on their interference with it. Right. And the solution is always to do more of what caused the problem, which always makes makes the next problem worse. So, yes, that is what's going to happen initially. That is what's happening now. Uh, it's going to get blamed on capitalism. So things are going to have to get really, really bad before anybody considers blaming government. See, that's what has to happen. The government has to make it so bad, right, that people are starving, that they're, they're, that they're lining up for hours for food, right, that there's all sorts of civil unrest. Things have to get really, really bad. And then, you know, there's a revolution against government. But what we have to make sure is that the government doesn't have the means to suppress that revolution. 
you know, because we have no more privacy anymore, no more rights, no more freedom. They take away all the guns because they want to make it so that we're all basically slaves. Wow. That's what that's what happens with these uh, communist countries. See, these communist leaders come to power in a communist revolution. They always promise to make everybody's lives better. Right. They promise, oh, if we just get rid of the bosses, get rid of the capitalists, you know, they won't exploit us anymore. We'll all have better lives. And so people believe that. But it doesn't take long before the communists destroy everything and people are much poorer. And then the only people who have money are the people who are in the Communist Party. Right. The people who are in government that have all the connections, they're the ones that have the money. And there's no longer a meritocracy. But let me just finish this. So then what happens is the people want to escape. The people want to leave communism or they, and now the government has to make it illegal. They have to lock you up. They have to build walls to keep you from fleeing because nobody wants to live in a worker's paradise because they find out that it's not paradise. It's hell. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Love it. And now, now, so that leads me to this question. How do you think this whole situation with the coronavirus, with the, the economic hit that we're already taking right now and, and we're in an election year, how do you think this is going to affect the election? Do you think it's going to make it more likely that someone like Donald Trump gets reelected? Or do you think it's going to make it more likely for someone like Joe Biden to get elected? Well, you know, it, I got mixed feelings on it. I mean, I, I tend to think that it makes it harder for Trump to get reelected because, you know, to the extent that we're in recession uh, and it's a bear market and people are unemployed, when they go to vote, they don't tend to reelect the incumbent. I mean, that's historical. Now, the question is, will Trump be able to convince the voters that everything would have been great and was great, except for the coronavirus, and therefore it's not his fault? Uh, and, and, um, and, and so, you know, he should be reelected because, you know, we'll, the economy will get back to the great place that it was at before the virus. Now, of course, it wasn't, we didn't have a great economy. We had a bubble. But, you know, will the voters know that? I mean, the voters... Uh, knew we had a weak economy under Obama. That's why they voted for Trump, because Trump told the truth to the voters about how lousy the economy was, despite government statistics, which painted a rosier picture. But now, as president, he's touting those same statistics as if they're they're real now, and they were frauds in the past, when now he's telling the same lie uh, that, that, that were told before. And, and so it's going to make it easier for Joe Biden to say, vote for me, and I'll, I'll make America great again, because Trump promised it, but didn't deliver it. Even without the coronavirus, people's lives were not really improving uh, under, under Trump. All we were doing was running bigger deficits. Uh, and, you know, and, and we were paying for government with bigger deficits instead of the income tax. Um, but so it, it depends on, you know, if Trump is able to successfully blame the coronavirus. I, mean, I think originally he was going to run against the Fed and claim that the Fed, it's the Fed's fault. Uh, but now I think it's a bigger boogeyman, and especially now that the Fed is doing everything he wants. They're printing all the money, and they're they're. Act- and it's ironic too when when Trump was a candidate, he was critical of Janet Yellen yeah. for keeping interest rates too low and printing too much money, and now he was critical of of, of Powell for uh, not printing enough money and for not keeping interest rates low enough. So he became an advocate of exactly what he criticized. Yeah. So a complete one eighty between candidate Trump and and President Trump. Uh, But, you know, I think that the election is going to come down to a battle of socialist ideologies, the socialism of the Republicans versus the socialism of the Democrats. And it's going to be an auction on who can promise the most free stuff. And I just think that the Republicans are always at a disadvantage once the election uh, is decided by free stuff, right? Because the Republicans have already... They, they can't advocate for freedom and capitalism and limited government. They've already bought into the myth that prosperity comes from government spending and that there's no cost to money printing. And so since they're now fighting this battle on the Democrats' turf, you know, I mean, they got the home field. I just I just think that if, if, if voters have a choice between a Democrat and a Democrat, They'll pick the Democrat every time, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so that that that's Biden, you know, uh, as opposed to as opposed to Trump. Okay. Now, uh, one more question here: um, How do you think this all of this is going to have? Uh, it, what kind of an impact do you think it's going to have on the psychology of people? Let's say things open up tomorrow, uh, no more shelter in place. You know, people are still a little scared. You know, maybe they don't want to go to the gym. Maybe they're scared to go to the store. 
how long do you think that's going to last? Because I feel like the fear of what's going on is going to linger far longer than the actual risk itself. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it seems to me now that government has a vested interest in not bringing this thing to an end because the longer they keep us all cooped up, uh, the more they can blame the problems on on the, on the virus. I mean, there's a lot of economic problems that were going to happen anyway, and now all of a sudden they can blame on the virus. You have all these states that were going to go bankrupt anyway. You have all these municipalities that were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Now they can claim, well, it's not our fault. We need all this bailout money because it's the virus. So a lot of governments, this is like a get-out-of-jail-free card for all of their past sins. You know, they just, oh, mm-hmm. oh, it's like, you can't blame us for this. So uh, in a way, there's a there's a vested interest to keep everything the way it is, you know, to, to, to maintain the scapegoat. But I do think even if like all of a sudden, like we cured the coronavirus, like, like we got a vaccine, we got a cure and people went back to work. A lot of people aren't going to have jobs to go back to, even if they want to, because a lot of people aren't going to want to go back to work because they make more money not working. Uh, but see, a lot of these companies were only kept afloat by debt. We had a credit bubble before the coronavirus pricked it. Now that that bubble has been pricked, you can't reflate it. So a lot of these companies that were being kept afloat by cheap money are going to fail during this situation. They're not going to be there. The jobs are not going to be there. So even if we recover from the coronavirus, all we're going to recover back into is a recession that we would have had anyway. You know, we're not going to suddenly have this great economy because there's nothing to go back to. People keep thinking that, well, it's, you know, we had a great economy before the crisis, and so we'll just go back to it after. No, we had a bubble economy before the crisis, and since the bubble popped, we can't go back to a bubble that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so uh, it's going to be different. And, and, and yes, I do think fewer people are going to eat in restaurants. So we need fewer restaurants. A lot of restaurants have to go out of business. Fewer people are going to go to the movies. So movie theaters have to shut down. I mean, I think people are going to be changing their behavior, both because of economic circumstances, because they don't have the money, right? They can't afford to eat out as much. They can't afford to go to the movies as much, uh, you know, especially when you could just, you know, eat home and watch Netflix. So, you know, you don't have to spend all that money. And so I think the economy is going to have to restructure based on that reality. Mm. And, and, and of course, the government's going to make it harder to do that with all the, the law, regulations and taxes that will slow down that, that process. But no, there, there is no going back uh, to, to Oz at this point. I mean, it, that, that's gone. And, and to, to that point, though, Peter, a lot of people are comparing this, the coronavirus and what's happening right now, more like what happened to us in 9-11 than like what happened in the housing crisis. So, and when, what happened with that was we did see a huge crash initially, but it rebounded in like 56 days. Now, what's to stop the government from just infusing money like crazy and reinflating another bubble and we see a crash, but then we're right back in, in two to three months? Well, okay, you have to look at the proportion uh, to what happened. So they were able to inflate a housing bubble very quickly after the stock market bubble popped. And in fact, the housing bubble didn't just begin to inflate when the stock market bubble popped. If you really look at the origin of the housing bubble, prices really started to move up in about 1997. And, and so that bubble had, you know, was forming uh, in 2000. And so what the government did by slashing rates to 1% was just add fuel to a bubble that had already started. And, and, and it was particularly powerful fuel because, you know, it was already in motion. And so that bubble was much bigger than the stock market bubble. And so the economy was able to go from bubble to bubble, right? And it was like, okay, this one is better. Uh, more people were getting rich in real estate than they were in stocks. And the big difference between real estate wealth and stock market wealth is, you, you know, most people weren't borrowing money against their stocks to go out and take vacations and buy cars and remodel their houses. But it was very common for people who owned homes to immediately extract any new equity in the form of a cash out refi or a home equity loan. So gains in real estate immediately translated into more economic activity, more spending. Plus, most people, when they bought stocks, they paid for the stocks in full. 
people were buying houses with minimal down payments or no down payments at all. So the return on housing was so much bigger because if, 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 if the stock market went up 20% and you put $10,000 into the stock market and it went up 20%, you made $2,000. But if real estate went up 20% and you bought a house for $500,000 and it went up 20%, you made $100,000 and you put nothing down. You got $100,000 for nothing. And then you just refinanced it or took out a loan and started buying all kinds of stuff. So that bubble was powerful enough that it created a phony recovery. Now, when that bubble popped in 2008, since it was a much bigger bubble than the stock market bubble, the resulting financial crisis was much worse. And I was warning about that for years because I knew that the problem with the real estate bubble was not the people who bought houses, but the people that loaned them the money. I knew that they weren't going to get their money back. So I knew a a drop in the housing market would produce a financial crisis, which is what happened. But when that happened, instead of learning from their mistakes and allowing a free market recovery, we then inflated an even bigger bubble in housing, in stocks, in bonds. I mean, there are people that call it the everything bubble, Uh, corporate buybacks, student loans. I mean, the government flooded the market with credit much more than it did uh, between 2001 and 2008, right? Of course, all Greenspan did was take interest rates to 1%. And they only stayed there for about a year and a half. And they did no quantitative easing. So that was, you know, nothing compared to, you know, the stuff that went on after 08, which is nothing compared to what's gone on now. So the reason it's not going to work again is because the bubble that just popped is so enormous, right? And the economic damage that was done as it was inflating is so huge that there is no way to replace that bubble with a bigger one. It's just impossible. Just if they try to do it, they end up destroying the dollar. We end up, you know, we overdose on stimulus. We, they, we die. Like, it's like if you, if you build up a drug habit that is so big, if every time you need to restart the habit, you need more and more drugs, eventually you could take, you know, you need so many drugs that you can't even survive uh, the, the, the dose that's required to get high. So, that is the problem. You know, we're not in a situation today where th- those tools are available. I've been saying for a long time, the Fed is out of bubbles. There's no more bubble blowing. There's no more rabbits in the hat. This is it. We're now going to have to deal with the consequences of the, the 2001 bubble, the dot-com bubble, of the housing bubble, and of this bubble. Because every time a bubble popped, we kicked a can down the road by making a bigger bubble. Mm. And then when that bubble popped and now we have a bigger can, we kicked that, that one. So now we have all these unresolved problems from you know going back decades that the market was never able to resolve and restructure from because we didn't want to deal with the pain. We kept delaying it to a later date. Well, we finally caught up to the can, right? This is it. No more kicking. We're going to have to deal with it, and it's going to be horrific. But at least on an individual level, as I said, if you want to come through this thing solvent financially, if you actually want to increase your wealth as other people are getting wiped out, you can do that as long as you make the right investments. That's what I've been doing personally, and that's what I'm trying to help as many Americans do uh, through my broker-dealer, Europe Pacific Capital. Thank you very, very much. Very, very. I think it was a, it was a great uh, podcast for people to kind of learn a little bit about what's going on, and I appreciate you giving people options because it is scary to hear a lot of the stuff that you're saying, and it would be really scary if we were left without uh, any options. So I, I really appreciate you giving those options to people. 